Welcome to this event, all of you, um, which is organized by SVESIF, Stockholm Environmental uh, Institute, Stockholm Resi Resilience Center, and Swedish Waterhouse, and CNI, which is an uh, organization um, focusing on um, food security. My name is Henrik Malmsteen. I'm the chairman of SVESIF, and uh, we are a network of about 40 uh, big organizations in the financial uh, industry that are focusing on sustainable investments. We are very happy to co-organize uh, this today with the expert organizations that I just mentioned. And we are honored to have uh, Mr. Pavan Suktev here today and um, talk about what organizations and companies must do today to be able to be successful tomorrow. And also how the financial industry that I come from can spur this development. So uh, warm welcome to all of you and I will give the floor to Mr. Johan Schillenstjärna. Please. Thank you very much. So a warm applaud. <laughs> okay, that's good. So um, I'm executive director of one of the organizations uh, behind this uh, seminar today, Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, today, though, I'm a moderator, so I'm the person asking the easy, stupid questions and inviting the audience to ask the difficult and very complex and you know, smart questions. So that's my role, and also to keep track of the flow of the discussions. I also like to welcome those uh, looking at this seminar through the web uh, as well. Uh, one piece of order, just to say that in the beginning, is because we have also a web-based audience, anyone who is speaking must have a microphone in front of him or herself before saying anything. So it will actually come out uh, as well. Let me check who the audience is here. Not that you're going to you know, state your name and organization and so on, but I want to check how many are within the financial sector in the room. Great. How many are within civil society excluding the private sector? A couple of people. Good. How many are uh, from... I know there are some politicians in here as well. Yeah, they're sitting on the corner there somewhere, you know, <laughs> sneaking there. That's good. How many are from other private sector, not the financial sector? Good, 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 good. Oh, wow. That's a big group over there as well. Research. Okay, good spread, good spread. Uh, official, uh, government officials or government agencies and so on. Yes, good, good, good. So we have a good spread. How many have not yet said where they are from? A couple, you know. <laughs> research, research. <laughs> good, anyway, so we have a good spread of, of people here today. I'm not going to talk more. I want to invite Pavan Suktev to the floor and give him a warm applaud. Pavan, it's great to have you here. Thank I've you. had an opportunity to meet you a few times and to listen to you a few times, and every time I'm you know, equally fascinated. And I learn a lot of new stuff. This is your short title. Yeah. Your long one is partly in the program, and it's very long if you, you know, search on the internet. But let me ask you, you, I mean, you were a banker. That's right. Yeah. Why, why did you get into <laughs> this uh, sort of ecosystem yeah. services? Yeah. And, and why? It, was, it just bothered me for a long time that uh, some things were worth money and others were not, that people didn't understand the difference between price and value, mm -hmm. and that something I dearly loved in my personal life, that's nature, had a lot of value but no price. Mm -hmm. And yet in my professional life, I'm markets basically, markets, fixed income, foreign exchange, derivatives, origination, trading. It just My whole personal and professional lives were kind of being driven by different principles. And I was just trying to create that connection. But you were at Deutsche Bank before you then stepped into TEEB and yeah. UNEP and so yeah. what, what did your colleagues at the Deutsche Bank say when, you know, by the way, I'm not now going to step into <laughs> sort of ecology <laughs> and ecosystem services. Did they say, wow, or what? It was pretty gradual, actually. So everyone at Deutsche knew that, oh, this is the, the you know, head of Money Markets Asia Pacific. You can't call him for this conference call because he's in some forest. You know, okay. <laughs> so they kind of knew my weird habits and they sort of realized that at the same time I'm still meeting my targets, so they mm. couldn't really 
complain as much. And they were kind of fascinated by that. Yeah, he does these strange things. You know, he's got this NGO in India which does green accounting, whatever the hell that means. So anyway, I mean, I was kind of considered a slightly strange banker in that sense because I had these other hobbies at the mm -hmm. same time. But w when mm -hmm. you took on this role, um, it's when did Teep start in yeah. 2000? 2008. Eight. Yeah. Would you say, I mean, it's not only about six years, but you have been connected still to the financial sector. Do yeah, you see a much. shift happening or is it still sort of some outliers? And so I think um, it's true that if in 2008 I you know, went to someone saying, you know, the economic invisibility of nature is a real problem. The eyes would glaze over, <laughs> like, you know, what the hell is this guy on about? You know, why can't he talk about the next major debt issue or something? Um, but now if I say, you know, the economic invisibility of nature is clearly a problem, they say, yeah, yeah, well, can you tell us, remind us what you said then? And you, I find a different attitude. It's almost. a different attitude, yeah. yeah. And just in a few words, what are you doing today? Your title there, can you tell us a few, few lines? Uh, sure, I mean... Um, basically, I, I now, TEAB has been delivered as a project, but TEAB's next phase is on, which is implementation. So this is about implementing TEAB at the country level, and there are already 25 countries who are moving forward with setting up processes to collect the data and the policy analysis and doing TEAB in a country. But today I want to spend a bit more time, especially mm. with this audience, um, from the private sector and from finance, talking about what's happening with TEAB for the business. Mm. Uh, and actually, a lot is happening. Many companies have moved forward and recognized the importance of ecosystem services and started some valuation experiments. Other groups have formed. One massive group with which I'm involved called the TEAB for Business Coalition was formed uh, a, a year ago. And now we're going to rename ourselves the Natural Capital Coalition. It's still very much part of the TEAB family. Mm. And our purpose is to encourage as many sectors in as many geographies as possible to start working out their externalities and do it in a collaborative way which is not you know private and black boxy but actually very public and very open mm. but shared so the cement sector does things together the apparel sector does things together food together and so on and so forth so that's actually quite a lot of progress that's that's a perfect introduction um, i give you the floor just to explain pavan has about 35 minutes or so after that, we're going to have a small panel we'll, you know, that will reflect a little bit on what you are saying and, and discussing and also add very interesting dimensions. Sure. And then we're going to have an open discussion. Great. So if you have questions for Pavan, please note them down so we can get back to them also in the panel discussion. Pavan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Give him an applaud. So when I talk about the increasing importance of ecosystem services, Actually, it's always been there. Ecosystems have been very much our home. Uh, we exist as human beings and in societies because of the natural world within which we survive and which provides us sustenance and food and fuel and fiber and basically everything, actually. I mean, anything in this room that is either not mined or not grown doesn't exist, and all of us are <laughs> included. So we, re we depend on nature. We are part of nature. So when I say increasing importance, actually... It's really increasing in the minds and the eyes of policymakers, of administrators, of businesses, yeah, and probably of some civil society. And that's pretty much what TEAB is about. But let me first go back to an example of what, of what I mean. And this is basically the Brazilian rainforest. Um, it's seen more often as a great store of carbon, a great source of biodiversity. But few understand that actually the Amazon rainforest is in fact a rainfall factory. And it's not the only one, but it's the largest one. And uh, if this film works, then you will see what I mean in a moment. Because there are actually three large areas, which are rainforest areas, which are generating, as we stand today, most of the flows of fresh water that we see. Here's uh, an image from, based on a satellite compilation. This is basically the water cycle, the global water cycle. When you see those flows, those white things are basically water vapor forming, and you, see, you can see the, the time moving. It's basically two, three, four, each half second of the day. Right? So you can imagine this is basically, if you look at the colors out here, the orange represents precipitation, the white represents water vapor. Just see that heart beating. It's a daily beating heart, the entire Amazon rainforest. And then look here. 
Do you see the colors changing? Another beating heart. And then look here, Indonesian archipelago. So these three areas of the world's rainforests are actually providing the evapotranspiration, the water vapor basically, into the, into the atmosphere, which then precipitates as rain. And it is that rainfall that provides the irrigation for basically all of our food. That's how important this one ecosystem service is. And that's how global it is. It's almost magical when you look at this, right? You sort of get a feeling that, oh my God, this is what we are messing about with when we destroy rainforests and when we deplete biodiversity and reduce forest cover. This is the cycle that we are messing with. The interesting thing about this cycle is that it rains where it rains. You cannot tell a cloud where to rain. So no matter what you think in your markets thinking or in your management or in your policy making, you cannot actually tell the cloud where to rain. So it is impossible to change this ecosystem service of the rainfall cycle into anything but a public service. It will always remain public because we do not have the means of converting this into a marketplace and neither should we want to do so. There is no need. You can conserve this and most of what I'm describing to you today is about that argument what we can do to conserve these beating hearts to ensure that we continue forever to receive the rainfall that provides the irrigation that gives us our food. For this is courtesy the NOAA, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association of the US. Specifically, if we look at uh, Latin America itself, this rainfall cycle, the northeastern trade winds, basically picking up that water vapor, precipitating, are what provide the agricultural economy of Latin America. That's about $250 billion of an agricultural economy. Main water source is this rainfall cycle. And of course, the countries of Uruguay, Paraguay, the plains of Mato Grosso here, the plains of Argentina, they receive the benefit from this water cycle, but they don't pay any. And that's part of the problem, because when we manage things on an economic and political basis, we depend upon money flows. And there are no money flows out here to ensure that this public good supply, the supply of public goods and services of rainfall, actually continues to do what it does. So that's how rainfall, one ecosystem service, the, the Rainfo rain rainforest ecosystem service of rainfall, basically, is of value to all of us. But there are also specific dimensions of ecosystem services that we need to think about, which are valuable. And let me just pick two. And I begin with the old conundrum of should we have development or should we have environmental uh, consciousness? Should, should we have uh, development in the developing countries or should we conserve their environment? And to me, that's a false trade-off. That entire trade-off has been falsely framed. And frankly, I, I now begin to suspect by people who, in whose interest it is not to see a different world. Because when we looked in the TEEB analysis, this is from the TEEB uh, for policymakers, the, the, the first volume. When we looked at three countries, Brazil, India, Indonesia, and if we measure their ecosystem services, typically to get an idea of how large these ecosystem service flows are, nutrients, fresh water, cycling, soil erosion prevention, et cetera, et cetera. The answers are 10, 16, 21%. So let's say 10 to 20% in, in terms of GDP. Of course, these are invisible, so they're not actually part of GDP, except that some of them add to the production function of agriculture, which then is captured by GDP. But you're not seeing this element. The pollination of bees would add to the production of fruit, and therefore it would be picked up somewhere in GDP, but it's not called bee-based pollination. It's just called fruit or agriculture. So these are the, the sizes of ecosystem services. So missing them, in other words, the economic invisibility of these ecosystem services would appear not to be a big thing. I mean, okay, fine, so you're misstating GDP by 10, 20 percent, and so what? It's an estimate anyway. GDP is an estimate. It consists of corporate profits, which nobody totally calculates, salaries, which you have to work out, net interest, net rentals, and a few other adjustments. That's the income measure of GDP. So it's an estimate at the best of times. So what's wrong if it's kind of wrong. Most estimates are wrong, right? But actually, that's not the problem. 
The problem here is we've got, in looking at ecosystem services as a fraction of GDP, in terms of the missing GDP, is in fact the wrong numerator and the wrong denominator. And here's why. What we need to worry about, in fact, is the dependency of the poor on ecosystem services. Because when they are missing, when the forest is lost, whose nutrients and fresh water flows are lost is basically the poor farmer. Whose wives, 60% of cooking, is done with fuel wood. So whose wives do not anymore have fuel wood? It's the poor farmer. And whose cattle and whose goats cannot go into the forest to feed on leaf litter? Again, the poor farmer. So actually, the issue here is not ecosystem services overall as part of the economy missing, invisible, etc., but ecosystem services used and consumed by the poor household as a fraction of the GDP of the poor household, the GDP of the poor. And when we did the calculations again, using a different model and looking at the 20 million people in Brazil who depend on uh, gathering uh, nuts and, and uh, coconuts and various other things from the forest, if we looked at the 100 million people in Indonesia who are small farmers, or the 350 million people of whom in India who are 280 million small farmers and, and another uh, 70, 80 million forest-dependent tribals, if we looked at them, then these ecosystem services were actually more like 47%, 75%, 90% of their household incomes. So this is why when we talk about the so-called trade-off between poverty and the environment, in fact, it's not a trade-off. It's two sides of the same coin. You need to maintain the ecosystem services in order that the GDP of the poor is not di diminished. On top of that, you need to add education, you need to add health services, and you need to have alternative employment opportunities. That's true development. You cannot have a development strategy which kills the GDP of the poor and then tries to replace it with, with some other gizmos. You know. By the way, small farming employs something like a billion people, so if you're trying to replace those small farmers with something else, what exactly do you think they will do? One billion people making Ferraris? What? It doesn't happen. That's not reality. So let people wake up and get to understand that development, proper development policy, recognizes to begin with the value of ecosystem services for the poor. This actually, in my opinion, was the single most important message and calculation coming out of the TEAB reports. And I believe it has made a difference, including in my country, in terms of some of the thinking, the warped thinking that used to go on earlier. But equally for businesses, ecosystem services are hugely important. And I think of this, and TEAB, the so-called TEAB for Business book, uh, represents this in, in four ways. One, in terms of the dependencies and the impacts and the other in terms of the opportunities and the risks. So there are a whole range of businesses who depend on the climate stability that's provided by ecosystems. Uh, practically everybody depends on that. Agri-productivity depends on fresh water, the cycle that I described to you, soil erosion prevention, the, 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 the making of soil for that matter, nutrients and, and, and uh, biomass in soils. There's any amount of materials that are extracted all the way from coral reefs providing uh, uh, materials to forests providing wood, to um, in jute and, and uh, cotton and so on. These are all sort of materials. And then, of course, there's medicines which are provided. Basically, most, almost 60% of all medicines are either discovered in a rainforest in a reef, and then they are converted from there into molecules which are then manufactured uh, by industry, and so on and so on. So there are any number of, of dependencies of businesses of various kinds upon ecosystem services. But equally, there are any number of impacts as well, because if you look at the emissions and a lot of industry, a lot of industrial emissions basically um, are the very same businesses that we talk about, and likewise agricultural emissions. But emissions account for many of the impacts on ecosystems. Uh, climate changing emissions change temperatures, which therefore create risks and, and can lose entire ecosystems, and certainly species can be lost. Uh, equally, emissions, carbon dioxide emissions especially, are absorbed by the oceans. They become carbolic acid, and as a result of that, the alkalinity of the oceans declines. Higher acidity in the oceans means basically coral reefs can't recover once they are bleached by, again, global warming effects. And at the same time, it means that uh, because the oceans are less alkaline, the substrate, the, the, the aragonite, that is the base of corals, cannot form. So the regeneration of coral reefs is prevented. So just see the impacts of, of emissions of, uh, of the business world and its impacts on nature.
and of course, freshwater depletion and so on and so forth. So that's in terms of the dependencies and the impacts. But let's look for a moment also on the opportunities, because to solve some of these problems, there are huge opportunities in creating market-based solutions for green carbons. There are amazing opportunities in biomimicry. And by the way, just a, a tribute to Janine Benius here, uh, the lady who shared the prize that I got, which you mentioned in, in Gothenburg. Uh, her work is on biomimicry, which is not looking at the materials flows from nature in terms of the goods that can be converted into food and fuel and fiber and traded in markets, not looking at the ecosystem services, uh, which cannot be converted to markets and should not be, uh, but are very important and they need recognition and demonstration and, and measurement. Um, but looking at the intellectual property of nature, looking basically to nature as a teacher of ideas, and literally like thousands of ideas which have been drawn from nature. Uh, Velcro is, is the most commonly known example. But Velcro basically was invented by a scientist who took his dog walking in Scotland and found that these burrs were sticking onto his dog's coat, and it was almost impossible to remove the burrs. And then he examined the burrs under the microscope and based basically invented Velcro using that same design. So, and there are literally thousands of examples with, of uh, techniques from nature. The logic is very simple. All these organisms that we see around us are bringing to us something like 3.8 billion years of development. They have millions, if not hundreds of millions, if not billions of years of knowledge because they've managed to survive on this planet. We are only 200,000 years old. We are really, really young as a species. We can learn from nature. That's the basic point that biomimicry is making. And there are many, many examples of how we can do better by learning from nature. Try and figure out how did something else in nature solve the problem that we have today, and then you might have a better solution. And one of the interesting things about nature is that it doesn't have waste. In fact, there are people I know, including Janine and, and others, who say waste is a design defect. If you've produced waste, that means you must have misdesigned the system. So there's so much that really, and then of course, cradle to cradle systems, including designing entire cities on the basis of cradle to cradle logic, that also happens. So there is definitely a lot of opportunity. But also, there are risks. The level of disruption that can affect business, I know personally, because I have a small property in Australia, which I share with some partners. And I remember that I had to pay insurance premiums when the first cyclone hit that, that area in Australia, Cyclone Larry, that was 2005 or something. Premiums went up, and this is on my property, from about 1,200 Australian dollars to about 1,600. Then next year, they went up to 2,600. Then next year, as soon as the statistics started reflecting it, the next quotation was $5,500. I refused to pay. And then I figured out, okay, what am I really insuring? I reduced it by getting less insurance. Now, I just checked again, it's still about $3,000. So that's how much the premium of insurance spiked up as a result of two cyclones in that, in that region. Business disruption can happen in all kinds of ways. Just because you don't have enough fish in the seas because of overfishing, it would result in the Malaysian Straits getting more pirates because they need money, and the only way they can get some is to do piracy because the fisheries have, have, have depleted as a result of which safe passage through the Malacca Straits is difficult. So all kinds of logistical problems and problems in the world of logistics happen because of the depletion of fisheries, basically. So these are the kind of disruptions that can happen. Resource prices, cotton prices going up because of freshwater scarcity. And I think the, the one that I want to focus on, uh, which isn't often talked about, is that the risks, basically, that we are talking about of losing your social license to operate comes as a result of these impacts. And I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining why I'm saying that and what can be done to solve this problem. Because today we are in a situation where planetary boundaries are being affected by business externalities. And it's a kind of a free lunch, a massive free lunch. And this can't go on. And one of the first two things that I learned as a, as a career banker was there are no free lunches. And the other thing I learned was you cannot manage what you do not measure. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now describing and developing this theme of the impacts of business, why they are significant, why they are important, what can be done to reduce them, and why measurement is actually one of the most important elements of the solution. So firstly, let's talk a bit more about the risk picture. How many have seen this diagram already? That's excellent. I'm speaking with an educated audience. So. <laughs> 
So this is, of course, the planetary boundaries diagram done by the Stockholm Resilience Center. In full disclosure, I am a board member of the center, but it's a great diagram nevertheless. So, um, but what it's saying is essentially that planetary boundaries are being approached. The green circle represents the sort of notional boundary, and the red wedges represent how far we've gone versus those boundaries. So you can see, according to the SRC and their colleagues, that we've just crossed climate change boundaries and definitely crossed nitrogen pollution and biodiversity loss excessively. Uh, that's obviously against a historic mean uh, species loss rate. But there are also pressures building up on something like phosphorus, pressures on fresh water, pressures on deforestation, ch change in land use, and, and pressures on ocean acidification, which has impacts on the entire fishery supply chain, but also on coral reefs at the same time. So clearly there are boundaries building up, and uh, we are all familiar with the climate negotiations and the number of times that the IPCC report uses the year 2020 as a benchmark year, by which trends have to change, by which definitely actions have to be taken at a global scale in order to reduce that particular boundary. Now, a few words about the cause of the risk picture, and I'll explain a further, a further why, but just give you a sense of size. A research a report was prepared by TrueCost, which is a research house in the UK, and once again, um, I have to disclose that they are a business partner, but the report was before I became a business partner, so I hope I'm okay in using this. But essentially, their report said, which was for the UNPRI, that uh, the estimated damages of the top 3,000 companies, the externalities, the third-party costs of doing business as usual, are of the order of $2.15 trillion. That's $2.15 million, million dollars per annum. For those not steeped in the concept of externalities, basically it's the third-party costs of doing business as usual. If I'm a car maker, I make cars, I sell you the car, I make a profit, I'm happy. You drive the car, you take your family, friends around, you're happy. You may not be happy because your home, I don't know, in Costa Havits or somewhere, has been affected by climate changing sea level rise. Uh, you may not be happy because you, know, you have bronchial problems as a result of the emissions uh, pollution that you cause driving my car. But there's nothing that prevented me from making that car and nothing that prevented you from driving it. So it's a legal bilateral transaction. It's just that we have externalities. These other two people are affected. We are not required to report those externalities. I did not calculate for these externalities when I made the car. You didn't when you drove the car. That's what it's about. It's third-party impacts of doing business as usual because not every damage impact can be included. And unfortunately, in economics, the tendency has been to say there are externalities and just ignore it as if it doesn't matter. But when you have externalities whose economic size is 3.5% of global GDP, for God's sakes, that can't be a reason for ignoring it. That's like seriously big. That's bigger than the GDP of many countries, including my own. Now, here's the interesting thing. I mentioned to you about the top externalities. Let me just point out three of them. Greenhouse gases, water abstraction, and uh, the depletion of natural resources. Just remember those three things in your mind, and now take a fresh look at the planetary boundaries diagram that I showed you earlier. Greenhouse gases, water abstraction, and natural resource depletion. These three are basically accounting for six of our planetary boundary problems. Greenhouse gases cause both climate change and ocean, ocean acidification. Depletion of natural resources is taking place both across nitrogen, phosphorus, and of course biodiversity. And water abstraction is basically where the water uh, shortage comes from. So the importance of business externality is not just that they are huge, that they are the biggest free lunch since the creation of the universe, but also because they are the cause of our inexorable march towards planetary boundaries. That's why externalities are important. And considering they are so important, I just am continuously amazed, and it was that reason that I was sharing with you just a moment ago. That was the reason why I got completely obsessed with this need to do something about externalities. How can something be so important and so totally ignored in our current economic system? Now, easy to describe any problem, but solving it is always a lot more difficult. And the problems that we have today are really complex and difficult problems. They are wicked problems in the words of some analysts. But the way I look at this whole challenge of having an economic system which creates excessive demand, has underpriced supply, faces severe resource depletion, and has serious public capital losses in terms of the loss of biodiversity and degradation of ecosystems, the way to look at that is to see where it's coming from. 
So these are the macro issues, but actually each one of them has a micro driver because it's the culture of consumerism fueled by marketing and advertising that's causing the excess demand. It's a combination of unaccounted costs of, of financial crises, which it's maybe the banks or their customers who cause the crisis, but who suffer is someone else. There was a calculation done by Ed Barbier that for every 1% loss in GDP, another 20 million people are pushed below the poverty line. Um, then, of course, there's resource depletion. We do not price resources correctly, especially natural resources. And, of course, there's this whole issue of externalized costs. Um, Yvonne Chouinard, who is the uh, uh, founder of Patagonia, uh, this clothing company which believes in, in absorbing uh, the costs of their, of their impacts and using low-impact uh, uh, materials, including organic cotton, he said that everything manufactured is sold at a price cheaper than its cost. Everything manufactured is sold at a price cheaper than its cost. That sounds at one level to be a recipe for, a, for commercial disaster, but in fact, it's a statement of truth. Because what he was really say, saying when he said that is that we don't account for externalities, we don't account for all these other costs. That's the defects in our economic system. Now, just let's not only look at the, the analysis and the, and the sort of... Uh, if you like the bad news, the good news is that for every one of these corporation-level drivers, the micro-drivers, as I call them, of our macro-problems, for every one of the micro-drivers, there exists a whole set of solutions. It's just that today we are in such intellectual disarray that we are not analyzing what we actually need to do. And it's not for want of, and I noticed there were a few NGOs in here, it's not for want of people who agitate, and you are all doing a great job to bring focus and attention and solutions to what, what you are trying to solve. But pause for a moment and think how much more effective you might be if you understood that actually three-fourths of the economy is the private sector, therefore it's basically the corporation nowadays, and that this corporation and its current model of success is the main driver of all of our planetary boundary problems, not just on the natural side, but actually many of them on the social and the equity side as well. And if you recognize that, if, if you like, the agitators had that education, and indeed if the educated like us were agitators, imagine the power of change that we could deliver to this world. But it's there in front of us, so we have solutions as well, and of course one of those solutions on the side of externalities is to start measuring and disclosing externalities. Because the moment you provide information in a credible, organized manner to people, they can respond. People can respond, NGOs can respond, businesses themselves can respond, and of course governments, when they observe this, will need to respond, because at the end of the day, maintaining public capital is the job of governments. It's not any private agent whose job it is to maintain public space and public capital, it is the governments, but they choose to ignore their own jobs. This is what is happening right now. The disclosure of externalities is, I must point out, not only a question of measuring your impacts on natural capital, although that is, of course, a very important and central part of doing so. Because here's a picture of how many different areas of physical, human, social, and natural capital belonging privately to companies or to communities or to the public are actually impacted by any typical large corporation. So a large corporation potentially has areas, fields. I, one of my clients owns a space of 1,500 acres in one factory in which it has been planting trees. The ecosystem services from those trees actually are a decent offset of some of the emissions from that factory. So there are impacts on the public of private spaces as well. Of course, there are impacts on community forests and grazing commons, and of course there are impacts on high seas fisheries which are being depleted because of various reasons that we are familiar with, and impacts on forests. And then there are social capital impacts and there are human capital impacts, quite big positive impacts in some cases, like a client of mine called Infosys, $1.2 billion of positive human capital externalities, the creation of talent for use by the world, and passing out from them. They, they have 4,000, 5,000 people leaving them every year to join other companies and other countries. So there's a huge range of impacts that a corporation has, and yet the only bit of impact that we ask it to measure and report on is basically its impacts on physical capital, as in cash and, and physical and manufactured capital. So essentially, it's about shareholder wealth. That's the only thing we ask it to report. That's got to change. The accountancy profession has to start thinking widely and start asking for disclosure of all externalities, not just 
disclosure of financial P&L for shareholders. Basically, it's about looking at stakeholders rather than shareholders, thinking about stakeholder reporting. Essentially, a sustainable tomorrow will measure and report on all dimensions of impacts. And already there are some companies, including yours truly, who have decided to set up shop with one purpose in mind. I will measure externalities. Come to me if you have a problem. Don't tell me it's difficult. I will do it for you. And I'll do it for you at an Indian price because I've got smart young Indians whom I'm training to do this for me. Yeah. How's that? Deal? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's been done already. It was not news to those of you who are familiar with the Puma story. They did a fantastic job in preparing um, the first full externality statement in terms of their natural capital impacts, the so-called environmental P&L, EP&L, as Jochen Seitz calls it. Water use. Greenhouse gases turn out to be the big impacts. No surprise, because Puma makes shirts and shoes. Shirts require cotton to be grown. That uses water. You'd expect the tier four, which means the raw materials impacts of cotton and rubber, which is also grown using land use and, and emissions. And you would expect leather as well to have an impact. And sure enough, these are the reasons why some of the big impacts in Puma's in, in terms of the, uh, the total cost of, of their emissions and land use and so on, is actually from tier four and three, which means growing raw materials and processing raw materials. And the factory itself has almost negligible impact, just 6%. But the point is, Puma is responsible for its entire value chain, so it correctly accounts for all of those impacts and not just the bits inside the factory. So this was a great start, and I think it shows that a large company, $3.5 billion now, can actually go ahead and do these calculations. It is possible, and in fact, they've done more. They've even worked out specific impacts right down to the product level. So this is in demonstration phase right now, but, and this was picture take, which I took in Bonn last year. But they actually have worked out the per product impacts uh, by using their analysis. So you can see that this shirt, which by the way costs the same as the other shirt in, in terms of what you pay, but this has a higher footprint as against this one. And it's measured in euros, so you, know, you actually have hard numbers to look at. Now, it's great to have leaders like Puma doing the right thing, and I encourage everyone to do so. And like I said, don't complain that it's difficult, because I'm just going to give you my business card. And this is very simple. Don't complain. It can be done now. It has been done. And I think now the good news is that we are getting a whole host of organizations together in the form of a T business coalition. As I mentioned, now soon it's going to be called the Natural Capital Coalition. And it's basically here to encourage entire business sectors, let's say the whole food sector, or let's say the whole cement industry, or let's say the whole energy uh, uh, industry or coal-fired power, or groups like that, to work together because you need one, one standard. Many years ago, I was asked this simple question which I couldn't answer. So who has a worse impact on rainforest? Is it Unilever or is it PNG? And I couldn't answer, for, even though I'm supposed to be the expert on this, for very simple reasons. One is, I don't know what model they are used to calculate if they are calculating. Secondly, even if they are calculating, nobody is asking them to disclose. So, you know, unless I personally know their CEOs, I'm not going to find out. And C, there is no accountability. So basically, nobody has a detail of exactly one system or one methodology. And there is no rule to say that the black box used by one company is going to be the same as the black box used by the other company. So we need standards, we need guidelines, we need a common approach to this, and that's what this coalition is working towards. Um, it's actually a large number of organizations, including the World Business Council, GRI, uh, WRI, these are all board members. Peter Backer is himself a board member of the coalition. The Institute of Chartered Accountants of the UK has stated that they want to move forward with this, and I'm hoping that interest will arise from your accountancy institute as well. So there's clearly an effort, global effort, on the way in moving this forward to be able to provide the guidance that you require. And already we have some initial results, at least in terms of the size of these sectoral externalities. And these specifically I'm talking about have been published in a report that TrueCost had done for us, the coalition, uh, in April this year. It's available on the web, but I can send it to you if any issues. But I'll just make one point here, which is, this, again, the sheer size of these externalities. And these are the top externalities by sector and by region. So the top one happens to be coal-fired power in Eastern Asia, $450 billion of costs. Costs of coal-fired power, basically one is climate-changing costs, the other is health. 
because of the impact on people living nearby. And the third is buildings, because of the soot deposition on buildings and the cost of cleaning them. So these costs are huge, $450 billion as against, sorry, $450 billion as against the value of coal-fired power being only $440 billion. And that's the interesting comparison, like how much is the value generated, the, the final value addition, the element of GDP that's, that's sitting out there, versus the actual value of the sector in terms of its impacts. And the second highest is a story to tell, because here the second highest negative externality of $350 billion is actually cattle ranching and farming in South America, which basically means beef. And that's the cost of beef. It's a revenue line of $16 billion and an externality of $350 billion. So the social costs of beef growing, basically because of the forest being used up, not just for the beef, but for the soya, which is planted to feed the beef, is 18 times as much as the value of beef. If any of you here can think of a better example of global economic stupidity, please let me know. <laughs> but for the time being, this carries my vote. Yeah. Anyway, Brazil, of course, is a great place, but there are positive sides to, to Brazil as well, such as this company, Natura, which uses nature-based products. It produces it's a whole range of cosmetics. It's Brazil's largest cosmetics company. A whole range of cosmetics and personal products, all based on nature. And these uh, products are all sold by housewives. They, call them, they don't call them housewives, they call them consultants. 1.5 million housewives are working for Natura. And these consultants are basically delivering not just great sales for the company, but also positive externalities. So another example of positive externalities, and I'll tell you how. One, you are giving income to the woman in a Latin American household, and those of you familiar with those parts of the world know that makes a difference. Basically, the self-respect of the woman rises, so that's a positive externality. Second is you're teaching her skills, which she can use with other products with other, uh, in other circumstances, again, selling to the same group of friends, family, neighbors, etc. So that's another positive externality. Third, it's been found through research uh, that households in developing countries which, uh, where the woman earns have a higher expenditure on education and health. So therefore, effectively, there's a generational externality because you are helping children grow up to be more responsible, healthier citizens and, and better educated. And fourthly, this 1.5 million workforce is actually a flexible workforce which, who is on nobody's headcount. So essentially, there's no cost to the state or in terms of uh, social security and so on. And there's labor market flexibility. So for the economists, the classical economists, you would see that as an externality, positive externality of this business model. So just one business model dimension of, of one company is creating four significant positive externalities in, in this case. Uh, an interesting twist to this story is that when I met with Alessandro Carlucci, who's the CEO of Natura, um, it, by the way, this interview is on my website. There are actually quite a few interviews on www.corp2020.com. Uh, do check out the one with Jochen Seitz, with Alessandro Carlucci, with uh, uh, Rob Walton, the chairman of Walmart, and many other interesting people. Um, I asked him this question that, you know, how, why don't you sell in Europe? I mean, the Europeans love rainforest products, and they will really love what you have to sell. He looked at me and said, but, but you know, um, European housewives all work, so how will they sell? <laughs> so he was still thinking his business model in terms of, I sell through housewives. There aren't enough housewives with time to sell product. But of course, now they've moved on from there. When I next met him, he said that, ah, by the way, we are thinking of Facebook as an alternative community. See, their business model thinking is completely different. They don't want shops. They don't have any shops. They just sell through people. That's how it is. So what will create... Um, what will be the new kind of cooperation which delivers the green economy, which leads to sustainable development? I think it will be different from what we have today. It will be company with, a company with social purpose, whose goals are aligned with society. A company who is actually measuring its externalities as part of their job. The CEO gets a report not just of financial PNL, but of impacts on a year-on-year -year basis and a plan to reduce the negative impacts and increase the positive impacts, which creates human capital, like Infosys, the example which becomes a community like Natura. We're talking about a million and a half housewives selling the story of the company. And they believe these housewives to be their community. They, they call them, they use that word, this is our community. That's kind of the cooperation that I'm talking about in the future. And what do we need to get there? Not a hundred different things, just four things. Accountable advertising, limits to leverage, 
resource taxation instead of profits taxation and income taxation. Basically, it's a shift in the focus of taxation. And finally, but most importantly, measuring and disclosing externalities. And that's something, ladies and gentlemen, that I want all of you from every company in Sweden to think about and explore. I'm very happy to be contacted on this. My, my email address is public knowledge. Uh, this is the way forward, and I think this really needs to be done right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pavan. This was really excellent. I'm going to let you rest for a little while. Uh, but just before, you know, one thing we talk quite often about when we organize seminars is the fact that we tend to end up in seminars where we speak to those that are already convinced. Yes. Mm, yeah. I know. Yeah. So it's really nice when people are really challenging you. But I want to check here, you know, I, I'm nasty to you now. Yeah. How many in here, in broad terms, agree with Pavan? Okay, yeah. how many in here, in broad terms, disagree? Okay, we need one more seminar. Yeah. <laughs> Where are the rest of the people in this house? It must be, you know, come on, there has to be a few people. <laughs> Tell but me anyway. I'm talking crap, then I can justify why. So I'm, I'm going to ask the audience to yes. start really go into your brain and start to pick out those things that you want to challenge a little bit. So we have yeah. questions really coming sure. up yeah. later on. So Ch well, challenge can be also the how. Right? Exactly, the I mean, how We thing. may all agree on what to do, but we may not agree on how to do it. So I'm happy to take that, That's that challenge thing. as well. Yeah. That's great. Mm. So please... Yeah. Take a rest. Sure. You're going to have questions coming back to you, sure. and I ask my panelists to come up okay. and give them a warm applause when they come up on the yes. stage here. Yes. 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 Thanks. <laughs>